<clears throat> Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. In the gospel story, Jesus is challenged in trials and temptations over and over again. So you may not notice it because some of the scriptures we never preach on. In Mark, the gospel of Mark, after Palm Sunday, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and every other person that comes up to him tests him, challenges him, questions him, wants him to turn away from the path. So what do they do? What do they question about? One of the people that comes up running up to him to test him asks, well, if this man died and the wife married his brother and that brother died and then the next brother died and she married him and on and on and on. So she had seven husbands from the same family. After she dies, who is her husband? So a weird question to test Jesus with, right? But they were trying to catch him in, in issues that could lead him to challenge the law, to make it so it would be easier to contest his authority. And so they, they asked him questions that were meant to stump him, but also meant to make him say something that would allow them to get rid of him. So one of them came up to him and asked him, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Another came and said, what is the greatest commandment that God gave? But those aren't all the temptations and trials Jesus had. In the Gospel of Mark, it's really short. He is baptized, and then immediately, after God says, you are my beloved, with you I am pleased. He's cast out into the wilderness and stays there for 40 days, being fed by the angels. In Matthew, it doesn't quite go like that. After Jesus is baptized, we have an encounter with Jesus and the evil one. And Jesus out there in the wilderness after 40 days, which is just a sign of completeness. 40 days is meant to symbol completeness so that Jesus was in the wilderness and had a complete time. He was wrestled with all he needed to wrestle with. And at the end of that time, that's when the evil one shows up and says to him, after 40 days of not eating, why don't you make some bread? Why don't you make some bread so that you can eat and not be hungry anymore? And Jesus says to him, you cannot live by bread alone, but by the word of God. But the evil one tempts him even more. He takes him to the highest point on top of the temple and says, if I push you off, Will the angels come and lift you up? <clears throat> and Jesus says back, You shall not test the Lord your God. But the evil one isn't done yet. He takes Jesus to the top of the highest mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, This can all be yours. And Jesus again refuses again refuses to let those temptations of having anything he wants provided for him, of having any power he wants granted to him, of ruling over everyone. <coughs> Instead, he invites us on a different journey, a journey that involves times when we too will face trials and temptations, times when we will face evil in such horrid ways that we have to figure out what it means to follow God in the midst. So when we pray that every week, when we pray the line, 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What are we asking for? What are we asking of God? And maybe one of the reasons why that line is included in this prayer that Jesus gave us is that he knew that life was challenging, that there would be trouble and temptation, there would be trials that would impact us all the time. There would be time when we would not have enough energy and resources to make it through. And we would need to turn to God in those moments. That in those moments when we are tested, in those moments when evil is right in front of us, we pray. We pray to God, be with us. Be with us, lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As I've been thinking about this all week, evil has showed up clearly and precisely in the world this week. We see it every time we happen to turn on the television or open the newspaper or open our Facebook or Twitter feed. We see evil right in front of us. And this prayer is to help us in those moments. And what do I mean by we've seen evil? So I thought I'd read the lines from um, Rabbi Dania Rettenberg, who says, there is no justification for the mass murder of innocents. There's no justification for bombing a dance festival, for kidnapping elders and children, peace activists, gunning down families, burning houses with people alive in them, posting the murder of a grandmother on her own Facebook profile for grandchildren to see. The Hamas attack was a war crime. Murdering Jewish children is not fighting for human rights. War crimes are not the path to liberation. But she doesn't stop there, unlike many of the people you've seen on TV. She then goes on to say, there is no justification for blowing up buildings without warning, for bombing hospitals, the bombing of children, for illegal blockades that turn tiny strips of land into open air prisons, for unlawful killings, forced displacements, house demolitions, and land flood, abusing children in detention, restrictions on movement, dehumanization, and collective punishment, over 55 years of occupation, and so much more. We've seen evil this week. How do we turn from the evil that we're seeing? How do we know what voice to listen to? How do we know what information to listen to? How do we know when the news we're getting, whether it is Truthful or propaganda? And maybe that's part of why this prayer is here, right? To help us discern the evil that we don't know that we are seeing, or the evil that we see but we don't know the whole story of. And I thought about this a lot because I did try watching the regular news quest, and I had to turn it off right away because um, I think a general came on. And he was talking as if the Palestinians weren't humans, as if they weren't people too. But I've been watching, because I normally watch um, the PBS NewsHour, and their programming and understanding about what is happening in Israel and Palestine, <laughs> while not perfect, is much better. Because they still put on people who totally tell you falsehoods. And they don't always challenge those falsehoods. But then they will also give you the other side and talk to somebody who says the exact opposite of that person from the other group. And so there, at least, you can see that there are two sides to a question. 
And what do you do when you see evil in front of you? That's the hardest question to ask, right? Because what happened in Israel was horrific. What happened in Las Vegas five years ago, was it five years ago, when that gunman came in and just mowed down the people dancing in the street at a country concert? You can look at it and you can go, that is evil. But what do you do about evil? That's the question, right? How do you respond to such evil? And how do you separate out the people who are doing the horrific acts from the people of their same nationality? That's why we have to pray the prayer, right? Because we're inviting God into that moment. When we see those horrific acts, when we see that dance party mowed down, we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then when we see an order given that a 1.1 million people must evacuate in 24 hours. How is that possible? I just want you to ask, like, in 24 hours, how do you move 1.1 million people, half of whom are children? A lot of whom are usually sick and elderly who are left behind because they can't move. And then to watch as those people start pouring out to the only hope they have heading south because they can't go north because there's a barrier there that won't let them through. And they can only go so far south because there's a barrier there that won't let them through. They can't go into the ocean because there's a blockade that also prevents them from going through. And into that midst as they are fleeing, given an order that they have to leave, Bombs drop on them. They told them, leave, go south, get out of here. And then they dropped bombs on the people fleeing. What do we do in those moments? And so I come back to that line, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because the temptation when you see evil in front of you is to respond with vengeance and violence. To turn back and hit them as hard as we have been hit. Although at this point, they are not at equal numbers of death and not at equal numbers of injured. There are over 7,000 injured Palestinians. Oh, no, I don't remember the number, but it was over 1,000 that have been killed. And so the numbers are now unequal on one side. And when you have that unequalness, when you see something so horrible, how do you not turn to revenge as your first thought? And I don't know if I have a great answer for you. That's why we have the prayer, right? Because we're supposed to turn to God in those moments. We're to ask God to show us the way. Lead us not into temptation. The temptation when we encounter evil is to seek equal back. To do an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And yet we know that the person we chose to follow, a poor Palestinian Jew, right? All of you. A poor Palestinian Jew is who you chose to follow. If you chose to follow him, he told us. He told us what to do when confronted with evil. If you read the whole chapter before the Lord's Prayer. So we're in chapter 6. In chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount begins. 
and he talks to us about vengeance. He talks to us about evil. He talks to about hate. He talks about persecution. And he invites us into a different way. He invites us into a way that challenges that system that says when someone attacks you, you attack back. He challenges to, to think about the world differently. And this is important because we, we are supporting vengeance right now. After 9-11, we supported vengeance against people who hadn't even attacked us on 9-11. And we're in wars for, what was it, 20, 30 years with people who hadn't attacked us. And right now, every time I turn on my TV, every time I get an email from Eric Swalwell, who I thought I would like, but I'm not so happy with him, he tells me that there is unconditional, unconditional support for what Israel is doing. But it's not the people, right? It's the government. There is unconditional support for what the government is doing to another people. And I keep, because this week, this is my line, right? All week long, I've been thinking, how do I talk about this? Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. And, and I see all of our elected officials speaking evil, being tempted. Being tempted by violence, by vengeance. And don't get me wrong, I totally think Israel, the people, need to have a safe, secure place to live. But I also think the Palestinian Christians and Muslims need a safe place to live. And we need to figure that out. And maybe all those people who, when they're running for office, tell us how Christian they are, maybe we should send them the message back. Lead us not to, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That the temptation is to hurt, to lash out. But us, the followers of that poor Palestinian Jew, are taught a different way, a better way. We are taught to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to love our enemies. Now love does not mean condone, but love does not mean bomb the entire region so there's no place to live, starve them, and give them no water or electricity. There is a difference, right, between not condoning what they had done and obliterating them. And Jesus teaches us that path of nonviolence. I mean, that's who influenced Gandhi into transforming how he interacted with the Indian government. By reading about the Sermon on the Mount, he went back to India and practiced a new form to confront what had been happening. And here's the thing. The Palestinians have been doing that too. They have been out in the streets, but they don't show us that. Out in the streets, often, constantly, asking for the life to change. Asking for life to get better for them. Asking to be granted the privileges that other people have. Freedom of movement. The freedom for their children to grow up and be anything they want to be. To be able to travel. To be able to cross the border to see family that is in 
the West Bank, family that is in Jordan and Lebanon. They have tried the way of nonviolence, but that doesn't condone the act of murdering people at a party enjoying life. And so that's when we say this prayer, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. We're asking God to be with us in those moments. When that temptation for violence and revenge is holding us tight. When evil seems to be surrounding us. To remember that Jesus invites us to a different way. A way that he talked about, right? Everybody has enough bread for today. Everybody has the economic resources they need to live and to thrive. And everybody is rescued from evil. Jesus invites us into a path of love. And what does love look like at this moment? That's the hard part, right? What does love look like when it seems as if the world has fallen apart? Because Palestine and Israel is a mess, but that means we're forgetting about Ukraine and Russia. And Sudan has just been a blip in the radar that you may not even know that they're still fighting. And we know that evil is coming. And how will we face it? And why do I say that? I say it partly because as we watch the Palestinians go into a time where people are not allowed to bring them food, and in fact, the aid workers are dying because they are being bombed, we know that with climate change, our food is becoming to become an issue that causes conflict and violence. It's part of the reason that in the Sahel, the part of Africa where drought has taken over, that people have had to migrate and move and that has led to already conflicts and skirmishes that the people are fighting in Ethiopia and Sudan and all those regions because they're fighting over a scarce resource, a resource that is scarce because we have caused drought. And they don't have the ability to create the food that they once had. We know that evil is coming and we have to figure out as Christians, how we will respond. How we will respond when we see evil in front of us. And I wish I could tell you, this is what you do. And I will grant you that if you read five chapter, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, Jesus does tell you how to respond. The question is, do we want to list it? Right? Are we tempted not to follow the person that we gave our lives to? Because what he asks of us is hard. What he asks of us puts us at odds with our own culture and government. What Jesus asks of us asks us to help change the world into a world that represents what God dreams of what God wants to be, a world where everyone is fed, where everyone is clothed, where there aren't open-air prison concentration camps because the prisoners are freed. He shows us what the world could be. And so your challenge over and over again is to reconfirm your commitment your passion for what Jesus has taught us about how to live and be. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.